Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Gerald, and thank you, uh, Minister Williams, and thank you, of course, to Honorable Julia Gillard for your leadership and for all the work that you do on behalf of women and girls and in Victoria, in Australia, and really around the world. You're amazing role models for all of us, so thank you very much. What I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is give you a bit of an idea of how we might be able to think about promoting gender equality by using, in particular, behavioral insights. So I want to take us back um, for a moment and we're just trying to click here, but maybe the battery is dead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, the kangaroo, right. So I had to show you the kangaroo. I'm actually starting here with the kangaroo because, of course, for you, this is not spec. Well, now it's working. OK. <laughs> um, for you, this is not, 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 not anything special. But for people outside of Australia, this image here stands for something. So there's immediately an association with Australia. And of course, we're using lots of these icons um, more generally uh, to make associations between people and professions, between people and expertise. Here you have a list of icons that I recently came um, about when I looked for an icon for an expert. This is just a random website that I found. And I found 224 icons for experts, and exactly six were of women. So that's kind of what we're up against here. And of course, Cheryl also talked um, about this a bit, that this is everywhere. This is also, of course, in sports. And for women to be on the front page, it's not enough, of course, to get the gold medal and break the world record. So that's the challenge um, that we're up against. We sometimes refer to this as unconscious bias, implicit bias, stereotypes, these associations that we make between people and certain uh, professions, certain places in the world, certain leadership roles or not. Here we have Heidi Roizen. Heidi Roizen is a real person. She's a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, an entrepreneur, a very successful woman. And she's interesting for many reasons, but the purpose that I'm using her for right now is that we now use a case study about Heidi in our classrooms to teach students about the power of unconscious bias in a matter of minutes. Because half of our students now get the case with the protagonist being called Heidi, and the other half with the protagonist being called Howard. And then they prepare for class, and they also fill out a questionnaire about how well Heidi and Howard are doing and how likable Heidi and Howard are. And sadly, what we find time and again is that men and women agree that both Heidi and Howard do a good job, but we don't like Heidi. And we don't want to hire her, and we wouldn't want to work with her because she defies our stereotypes of what a good woman does she also defies our stereotypes of what a venture capitalist looks like. So that's what we're up against here today. And um, maybe to put yourself to the test for a moment, I wanted to show you this little checkerboard here and ask you to compare squares A and B for me. And I presume most of you see square B as being lighter than square A. And I'm now going to cover the surroundings. And I imagine that about now, you are starting to realize that, in fact, they have the same color. You're not trusting me, so let me go back um, and prove to you that, in fact, I didn't do anything to be. So why is that happening? In your minds, you're making sense of the pattern that you see here. It's a checkerboard, and logic dictates that a light square has to be next to a dark square. We're arguing that this kind of thinking, in fact, does not only apply to checkerboards, but also to people. You see patterns in the world, and if you don't see many female venture capitalists or male nurses, for that matter, you don't associate those jobs with women and men, respectively. So that's what we're up against, and that's good news and bad news. It's good news because it is about all of us. Unconscious bias is shared because of our psychology and because we are humans. It's bad news, again, because it's about all of us, and that means, of course, it will be hard to overcome. So what I'm doing now is I'm liberating your minds to give square B a fair chance. And in many ways, I'm arguing that that's exactly what we have to do when we evaluate people, in particular, counter stereotypical people. We have to liberate ourselves from the patterns, from the stereotypes that keep us from really benefiting from 100% of the talent pool and really giving a chance to everyone. 
So that's my first diagnosis, in that I would argue unconscious bias is real, but that, of course, is not enough for us to move. Because still, people might say, yeah, well, I can get it, but why would I care? Life is good, business is flourishing, you know, there's no protests on the street, so why should we care? So let me give you kind of a few ideas very quickly here on why we should care. So one, of course, is the talent argument. It is just really silly and bad business to not benefit from 100% of the talent pool. This is one of the reasons why many of the large symphony orchestras in the United States have introduced curtains and have musicians now audition behind the curtain because they have learned that the curtain helps increase the fraction of women from about five percentage points in the 70s to now almost 40%. This is based on um, actual research. So the curtain is, of course, one way to do this, blinding ourselves to demographic characteristics. It is also something that many organizations, in fact, an increasing number of organizations, are experimenting with. And I'm, I want to be careful here, although I don't have time to go into detail, it doesn't work for everyone, but it is food for thought for all of you, at least, to think about what would happen if you de-identified people's CVs and didn't, in fact, base decisions on people's demographic characteristics or even their educational backgrounds. The second argument um, is also pretty obvious, that we kind of agree that our boardrooms shouldn't look like this anymore. We sometimes call this collective intelligence, that we now can measure the intelligence of teams the way we measure individual intelligence, and have found that diverse teams, in particular gender diverse teams, outperform homogenous teams. But thirdly, and, oh, before I, thirdly, I'm sorry, I actually snuck in here a slide about Australia. Sorry. So Australia, in fact, impressed me last week in the Financial Times, there's an excerpt from the Financial Times just of last week, um, published this data, which I didn't know about beforehand, that Australia was able to increase gender diversity on its corporate boards to now more than 30% in only two years. And that, that is an increase of more than 10 percentage points. The reason are, is twofold, one, uh, goals, which are soft goals, not hard goals, so not quotas, and secondly, interestingly enough, quite a bit of shareholder pressure. Um, as you can see here, France is kind of number one, but France introduced quotas. So this is a you know, legal reason. Um, they're up there, but I was actually quite impressed um, how far advanced Australia already is in that spectrum. Okay, now I'm going to go to the third argument, which of course is the most important argument, that even though there is a business case for gender diversity. The real argument has to be the human rights case. What we have here is a particularly awful example of human rights violations where we know that in some parts of the world, parents um, do kill their unborn daughters because they don't think that a girl has the same value as a boy. The economist coined this gender side. The estimates vary. The UN estimates is like 150 million girls that uh, are not around because of sex selective abortion or neglect in the first five years. That's really why we should care. So let me add kind of my second diagnosis. So yes, gender bias is real, and yes, we kind of understand that is it both, that it is gender equality both is the right and the smart thing to do. And still, I argue, this will not be enough. Many of us will still think it's just too hard. Change is too hard um, to make happen. So let's talk a bit about why change is so difficult. So right, intentions, of course, the theme of our conference here, intentions, virtuous intentions, are not enough to move the needle. Somehow these people, even though they want to exercise, still take the escalator. So part of the problem is this intention action gap that Raising awareness is just not going to be enough to move the needle. But secondly, there's another challenge that we are facing. And I have Sheryl Sandberg here to remind us of her work a few years ago on Lean In. Lean In, I think, was an important contribution to the literature, to the work, but it still made it a women's job, a woman's job. And I would argue that that's just not going to be enough. We cannot ask the traditionally disadvantaged groups to just do the work themselves. We know now, sadly, that there is, in fact, quite a bit of backlash that successful women experience. And women just cannot yet compete, lead, negotiate 
the same way men can without experiencing social backlash. That's really the Heidi effect that I started out with. So that leads me to my third diagnosis to say, yes, implicit bias is real, and yes, there's a business case and a human rights case, but thirdly, we have to now spend our energy on making it easier for people to get this right. And that's where I want to spend kind of the last um, part of my talk on, kind of this journey of behavioral science and how insights from behavioral science can help us kind of make a difference here. So let me give you just a few examples before I, in fact, want to use some of the insights that we learned this morning in our deliberative forum to illustrate um, how we could think about behavioral economics. So here's an example, um, this is not research, but it's just um, a good story of um, a meeting that I had a year ago, pretty much um, exactly a year ago in Stockholm with the Nobel Foundation. So the Nobel, Peace Pr uh, Nobel Prize is not just Peace Prize, the Nobel Prizes, as you probably know, in the sciences um, are not exactly the place of gender diversity. 97% um, of Nobel Prizes in the sciences have gone to men, 97%. So that's why I got the call from Stockholm, could I come and help? And the whole process is super secretive and I still don't know kind of most of the process, but some of it um, became public in the meantime. So I wanted to give you one example um, of the change that um, we introduced. So there is research suggesting that when we make bundle decisions, meaning when we make more than one appointment at a time, for example, when you hire, diversity is much more likely to emerge. In fact, let me take you back to the original study because it's gonna illustrate, I think, um, why this works. The original study had nothing to do with gender or diversity, but in fact, what they looked at were snack choices. So they did research in a school and they um, had two treatments. So there's a treatment group and the control group. And the treatment group was asked to choose a snack for every day of the next month. So today, this half of the room here will choose 30 snacks and you have 200 choices available, so lots of choices available, but you have to make 30 choices for every day of the month. Then this part of the room here chooses a snack every morning, also 30 times, but 30 times sequentially. But you're making simultaneous choices, you're making uh, sequential choices. And what they found was that people who choose sequentially are much more likely to go for their favorite snack. But every morning you're like virtuously thinking, I'm gonna go for the apple today, but you know, there is this Swiss chocolate bar, says the biased Swiss here, um, and then you go for the Swiss chocolate bar. Well, you see the 30 choices now, and even though you might prefer chocolate, you don't wanna be the kind of person who eats chocolate every day, and you think you will probably not want to have chocolate every day, so you go for more variety. So that's influenced some of our own research. Applying these principles to hiring, to promotion decisions, just generally to bundle decisions. And so that influenced my advice to the Nobel Committee in that I said, look, I'm one of the people every year who gets a letter from the Nobel Committee asking me to make suggestions for the Nobel Prize in Economics. In fact, they don't ask me for suggestions, they ask me for one suggestion. I said, this is a small thing you could do. Why don't you ask people to make three suggestions. That will increase the diversity of people they will recommend. Because if you ask people just for one person, they will go to the most obvious candidate, and that's often the person who kind of looks the part. So I'm happy to say, you know, again, not research, not data-driven, but they've introduced this change. We now ask to make three recommendations. We had a record number of female um, recipients of Nobel Prizes last year. So change is possible even through very small kind of nudges. So that's where I'd like to take you now, kind of arguing that in many ways this should be our goal. So many of you surely have been in a hotel room, as I'm right now, where the room key card doesn't only serve the purpose of closing doors, but also of turning lights on and off. And as you might imagine, a little bit of design, a little bit of technology here makes it so much easier that even those of us who actually care about preserving the environment will turn the light off. And that must be our goal, making it easier for all of us to get this right. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, walk you through kind of five remedies, five families of remedies really, uh, which came up in the Del deliberative forum this morning where people submitted about 20 different suggestions and ideas and insights um, and initiatives that they had been working on. 
The first one I think is pretty obvious. Seeing is, in fact, believing. It matters whether we see only you know, six experts being female. It matters whether we have enormous gender gaps in uh, sports reporting. It matters who is on the panel or who is behind the podium. As I said today, a bit earlier in our discussion, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but some of the best evidence, if you're interested in the impact of role models, the most rigorous scientific evidence comes out of India, because India, in fact, ran an experiment, randomly drew 30% of the villages which had to have um, female uh, leaders, female Pradhans, uh, they're called, um, or female mayors in office, and a third of the village um, parliaments being women. Lots of good research has come out of this, really proving the, the case that role models are important in shaping our aspirations in changing the landscape for men and women. But you should think harder about you know, where to take this role modeling effect. It also matters in our classrooms. And I also mentioned this, this um, earlier today, that it does matter to have people who look like you, in particular in counter stereotypical subjects. So boys do need male English teachers, and girls do need female math and science teachers. So seeing is believing, and Vic Health, of course, has done some amazing work in kind of helping us see ourselves in sports. So let me play this for just a moment. Gina. I feel immensely proud of Swell Mummers. When I first had Sunny, I went to this play group and it was in this kind of concrete box. It was very static. One of the things that I loved to do was surfing. After talking to a couple of friends, we decided that we'd go surfing but share the childcare on the beach. That was how it started. Mummy's surfing in the ocean. It's quite different to other mothers' groups. Mums and surfing, that's where Swell Mummers brings in two worlds that a lot of people would never have thought of. Some women still held back by a lot of these preconceptions about whether they're good enough. Even just simple things like they've never worn a wetsuit before and they actually don't know how to put one on. Any size, any body type, any ability can surf. When you come to Spell Mummers, you're not doing it alone. I spend a lot of my teenage years being the towel warmer and I want my daughter to know that she doesn't have to be the towel warmer. She can be the one out there in the waves. Remedy two. So those of you who have read my book will know that I'm actually quite skeptical of training initiatives. And I still am, although I have updated my insights slightly. When I wrote the book, um, I had to report that of all, this, of all the research that I could find, evaluating the impact of diversity training programs, I couldn't find a single one who found a positive impact. So why? Because it's actually really hard to change mindsets. That's why most of my work focuses on de-biasing systems rather than trying to de-biasing people. But having said this, I'm now updating a little bit because the research really is evolving, thankfully, trying to unpack whether every training really is worthless or whether we could in fact devise trainings that work under certain circumstances for certain people, under certain conditions, certain time frames. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of that evidence. In fact, let me not talk about the specific study um, in the interest of time, but just give you the gist of it. It does look like we now have some evidence suggesting that raising awareness of unconscious bias can have short-term impacts. And I still have to talk about a specific study because it's actually a good one. What the dependent variable in that study, in fact, was, was teachers' grading. So it's a hugely important high school last exam that the students have to write. And teachers were either informed of their results in an unconscious bias awareness exercise or not. And it turns out that on average, it worked for these teachers in that it decreased their gender gaps and there are also cultural gaps in their grading. However, this is actually really important information. There are, there's a distribution in terms of people's responses. It works for most people, but not for everyone. So what the researchers did, they also measured people's 
affinity, let's call it, to gender equality beforehand. So they used world value survey types of questions where people are asked how much they care about gender equality, you know, about the male breadwinner model, etc. And they also asked about their political affiliations. And the research was done in Italy. And what they found was that the intervention works in particular for people like you, like people like us in this room, who kind of cared, who already indicated that gender equality was an important consideration. Now they learned about unconscious bias. Now they really wanted to do something about that. It did not work. And that's the finding of the research for the most right-wing political party affiliates. This is the Liga Norte. Um, in Italy, and they even found some backlash among those people. So I do think this is important information kind of in advancing our understanding of training. Training doesn't necessarily have the same impact on everyone. So that's my update on unconscious bias training. I still don't think it's the answer, but I do think it can open some doors and raise some awareness. In addition, I wanted to have one other training program that I'm quite um, excited about that I thought you might also find inter uh, interesting. This is research in Zambia, which offered negotiation training to girls. And you might be surprised to hear about what these girls had to negotiate. Maybe you will be shocked to hear what these girls had to negotiate. These were mostly negotiations with their parents um, to have the right to be in school. These were also negotiations with what people who often are called sugar daddies, who pay these girls in return for sex. And it turns out that giving them the skills, giving them the training to in fact negotiate had tangible impacts. So we now know that these girls are more likely to stay in school, uh, decreases pregnancy rates, and increases the likelihood that they find a job. So training, again, is a multi-edged sword. That it can work, but we don't yet have enough evidence to kind of understand when does it work, under what circumstances, what are long-term impacts. And this is really maybe a plea to all of us, including to me, to myself, who I am, as I am an educator, to do a better job in, in fact, evaluating impacts. I wanted to end the segment on training also to, by going back here to Victoria, um, because training can take different shapes and form. Gerald's before, Gerald before um, talked about an intervention that has been conducted by Vic Health by informing clubs um, with a checklist on the kinds of things they might want to think about in terms of equalizing the playing field for boys and girls in sports clubs. And of course, a checklist is also an educational tool because the checklist asks many questions that these clubs had never asked before. For example, is there a place for children in your sports club? Because many parents, and including women, of course, can only do sports if there's a place for their children. Remedy three. Evidence, evidence, evidence. This is not going to be a surprise. I'm going to go very quickly here. But yes, I am very excited that we are definitely in a different time right now in that we have much more evidence to, in fact, understand what works and what doesn't work. And the rigor that we use in other parts of our lives now has entered gender equality as well. Here's an example from the UK that um, I'm not going to dwell on much um, now, but really focusing on measuring gender pay gaps uh, and here's one study that I thought I'm just going to quickly show you that I also mentioned in passing earlier, where we worked with a company that was very concerned about career advancement and gender differences in career advancement. And what we normally do when we work with a company, we first do a diagnosis. We're measuring what's happening. So do we have gender gaps in promotions? Is it because women exit more voluntarily or involuntarily? Or just do we not hire women? What we typically find is that the action is in promotions. And then you can zero in and really try to understand what's going on in terms of promotions. So here's what we found is something that we call a performance reward bias, in that these were women and men who were performing equally as well, but the same performance did not translate to the same kind of goodies for women. What you have on my slide here on the x-axis below are people's performance scores. So if you are a performance rating of one or two, that's relatively low. You're probably going to leave the company, so no, no likelihood of promotion. If you are a three, you're kind of in between. You see there's not much going on in terms of gender gaps. Blue are men and red are women. And then in terms of promotion ratings four and five, which are very high, it is not an oversight in my slide that you don't see a red bar because 
the correlation between performance ratings and likelihood of promotion for women was zero. That's a call for action for this company. The intervention that we're now testing um, looks at something that we call the gender promotion ratio, where we inform managers about their track record of promoting men and women uh, in the last five years compared to the available pool. And that itself, we can show, already moves the needle. Remedy four. So debiasing procedures is kind of the heart of the work that we do with um, Vic Health, that we do more generally in behavioral science. Just to give you um, kind of a little bit of insight into this, I have Coca-Cola up here um, because Coca-Cola a few years ago, not to, make, not to promote Coca-Cola specifically, but Coca-Cola a few years ago, many soft drink companies realized that diet was not a word that resonated with men, and so they introduced Coke Zero. Um, I think if Coke can do this um, on a product that we might care less about than about our hiring, we should be able to do this in our job advertisements. And that's, of course, the work that we have been doing with Vic Health, really focusing on the language that we use in our job advertisements to make it more inclusive. I'm going to wrap up because um, I, I am benefiting from a frozen clock. And so my clock is not, wor not working, so I thought, like, oh, that's great. I have, like, 16 minutes left. <laughs> but let me quickly wrap up. In fact, let me just um, go fast. Oh, no, I have to show you this very, very quickly um, because that question has come up a lot. Technology can be helpful. So those of you who are despairing now, you don't have the resources, the money, the capacity to actually introduce some of these insights, work with one of these startups. There's an enormous, an, uh, there's enormous number now of startups actually using these behavioral insights and translate them into technology to make it easier for all of us to get this right. And the last things, I'm going to go fast forward. No, I have to show you this very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly. I'm going to leave you with this when I'm um, thinking about inclusive practices. Um, I just want to show you this slide. It's actually my last slide. Um, that's really what we have to do. My, my question for you is, where would you be more likely to drop a piece of paper? On the right beach or on the left beach? The answer is obviously clear. And so the question for you that I want to leave you with is, what organization do you work for? Do you work in an organization that looks like the left beach or an organization that looks like the right beach? And is the, is the kind of environment where people feel entitled to not just drop a dirty paper, but also drop a dirty joke or worse? And that's really the task ahead of us right now, to move from the dirty beach to the clean beach, to really create an environment that is inclusive where people do belong. And on that note, I'm going to go fast forward and tell you that if you're interested, there's a film available called What Works, three minutes, summarizing what I just described now. So I'm not going to show you the film, but it's available on YouTube if you'd like to um, kind of remind yourself some of the things that we talked about. And with that, I'm wishing you good luck designing change. Thank you very much. <laughs>